Welcome to the ESCP Live, our digital talk show where we bring together experts from the ESCP community and beyond to talk about the hot management and leadership trends of our time. I'm very excited to have with me in the studio today our two experts here. The first is our own Simon Mercado, who is the Executive Vice President and Dean of ESCP's Executive Education, Corporate and External Relations. And we also have with us Mylene Ridal, formerly an executive in corporate communications for multinational companies. And she is today a speaker, writer, and executive coach. And we hope she'll share with us some of her insights on the several books she's written on happiness and leadership. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Emily. you. Mary, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've realized something actually in preparing for this that I thought was pretty cool. I'm American. You're British. That's right. And Marine, you're from Denmark originally. Yes, I'm born in Denmark. I lived in France for the past more than 25 years. Oh, that's amazing. And we didn't do it on purpose, but I felt like it really reflected a bit the ESCP energy of bringing people from around Europe and the world into one location. That's to... our signature. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we could all get together today here in Paris, um, no matter where we've come from before. And I know that you're both busy people, so I just want to dive right into our topic. The last time we were in this studio, we were actually with the Dean of ESCP and a fellow professor to talk about um, talent, what it means to be a talent today. And we approached this from a perspective really much about recruiting new talents. And today we wanted to look and start with the other side of the coin, you know, keeping the talents you already have which appears to be an entire challenge of its own and one that businesses are especially confronted with at the moment. Um, so my question for you is, how have the expectations of employees in the workplace changed towards their employers? What are they looking for? So it's actually changed a lot. I mean, it's gradually changed, um, but we're seeing now, especially after the pandemic, um, that people really need um, these human qualities in leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a study that came out very recently that BCG did, um, and it turns out that the one, the biggest quality or the quality that people want the most, these, it's 9,000 people across the world that they asked, it's uh, consideration. Mm -hmm. So people are asking for consideration, so you might ask, what is that? And, and it means that they want to be seen, understood, and accepted. And it, it, it can also be translated into recognition, um, empathy, uh, but basically feeling that they matter. Um, and so there are many variations of how you express it according to what personality you have as a leader, but it's definitely something 41% express this. It's huge. Um, and so, so this is definitely a major game changer. Uh, and it's, it's now also documented. People really said this is, this is what we want as one of the biggest qualities. And that's a big change. I was listening to Malina and, and, and I agree fundamentally. I, th I think we are in a completely different space. Mm. Uh, Post-pandemic, I'm afraid or I'm happy in, in a different way to say that the sort of classic nine to five work based work routine is 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 dead i would say for knowledge workers more specifically i think we have to be a little bit careful not to uh, over generalize yeah. the point there are massive differences in terms of the work day and work life experience of, of white and blue collar workers i think which is still very real uh, and yet i think all employees are looking for something fundamentally different today from their employing firms and I think recognition is recognition as a human being, uh, recognition for one's identity is a key part of that, and also the desire to work for organizations that have uh, themselves a very clear and strong identity. I think often when I when I am asked a question of this type, I, I rattle through a few key letters, and I and I think that one is the F for flexibility, mm -hmm. and then I think E because increasingly people want uh, to be able to work in a flexible fashion. They, they've gotten used in many ways to, to working more flexibly on a decentralized or remote basis and people certainly want choice increasingly. And in terms of uh, evaluation, I think they do want to be recognized and evaluated for different things. And that's not just about the volume of hours put in 
in the workplace. It's about productivity. It's about contribution. It's about the sense of difference an individual can have and feel within an organizational setting and respect of that and recognition of that. I think people are looking for cultures where diversity and inclusion uh, are fundamentals, um, can be critically important uh, to those from uh, minority backgrounds, but it's important to all. Mm -hmm. And then I think an emphasis in the firm on health and well-being of employees can be very uh, important. But I, I come down often to this point about purpose. I think increasingly people want to be uh, in an organization that has uh, a mission, a vision, a sense of purpose that goes beyond profit generation, uh, that is about potentially social and environmental impact, positive impact. And, and that increasingly aligns with people's own personal priorities and values. And I would agree to, uh, um, with Simon on the, the, the importance of purpose, because actually, if you have a great culture of um, trust and empathy, mm. and you show consideration and recognition, and people don't know why they get up in the morning, why is it that they do that, or do what they do, or if it's not there, then you might lose uh, your best mm. members of the team, uh, because they'll go somewhere else and look for that purpose, a reason to get up in the morning, if, a reason of, of, or a feeling of belonging to something that matters. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, making the world a better place is maybe a, a little bit of a big, a big ambition, but you know, in a small way, I think we should all strive to, to, to try to do that, and that's what people, I think, uh, especially the younger generation, they 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 want to to feel like they belong to something that matters. Yeah, I do think that that maybe was a question we were having before, but these last two years have maybe pushed it more to the forefront. You know, why am more. I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing in this job? In particular? I, I think that's one lasting effect of the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, we all know it's it's led us all to, in, in many respects, rethink our lives and rethink our priorities. Certainly, mm -hmm. we're questioning many yeah. things in a fundamental way: our work-life balance. Uh, how we can marry uh, economic security with happiness. And, and, and much of that comes down to our experience at work. And, and I might add here that it's interesting because you're probably familiar with the big study from Howard University of uh, 75 years where mm. they looked at what is it that makes you, you happy and, and what they found out, and this is basically the perspective that we don't have until it's too late because mm. 75 years, and so the conclusion is that the element that impacts our well-being the most throughout a lifetime, it's the quality of our relationships. Mm. And so that is a main ingredient to, to, to well-being and to feeling good mm. in, in a work environment and in your life in general, of course, as well. Um, so where I often insist is that we got to, or organizations need to be good at building quality relationships with their um, mm. employees. And, and so, and also in the member of the leadership team, the executive committee, um, it's, it's this capacity to actually knowing yourself well, um, mm -hmm. I work a lot on self-awareness, having a decent level of self-awareness, your base point and understanding other people. So empathy, often uh, we think it's putting yourself in other people's mm. shoes, but if you do that while maintaining yourself and you don't even realize completely who you are, this might be a disaster. Right. Because I come from a Scandinavian background, so I'm raised with a lot of freedom and, and courage, and I left my, you know, my, my home when I was 18, I went out traveling. So now if I, make, if I put myself in another person's shoes, not real as myself, uh, the, mm. the advice or the empathy that I'm trying to mm. show might be completely off if that person comes from a completely different background. So it's really uh, getting people to a decent level of self-awareness, which creates authenticity. When you're aware I of who you are key. and you dare to be that person, mm -hmm. yeah. um, it doesn't really matter who you are. And that is so interesting, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. in this topic, because what young people, or not only young people, what we're all looking for is just authentic people. I think, Melin, you've introduced already two key terms uh, and concepts for me, and that's authenticity and trust. Mm. And, I, and I think increasingly uh, people need and expect from their employers and from their leaders and managers within those same organizations, uh, the construction of a culture of trust, mm -hmm. where there is trust between uh, all members of the organization, irrespective of their position with the hierarchy of the firm, where there is trust in process, where there is trust 
in, in equity and justice mm -hmm. within the organization. And attaching to that authenticity, authenticity in terms of the organization walking the talk, the, the organization not just espousing specific values mm -hmm. uh, or implying that it does certain things, but that actually being a lived, a lived experience. And I think uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer is very interesting, actually. I don't know, uh, Marlene, if you, if you read that or you come <laughs> across it. But what that says, it's very interesting, is that the, the major institutions in society, uh, for example, government and the media, are in a state of crisis in terms of people's levels of trust with those institutions. Whereas today, still, people have a higher, relatively higher level of trust uh, in their employers, in, 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 in business organizations and firms. Uh, and that, therefore, for me, puts a great emphasis uh, on business firms and business organizations to actually deliver, deliver meaningfully for what individuals want in terms of their own lives and uh, education and training uh, and life experience more broadly, but also it puts, a, for me, a great responsibility on businesses and leaders of businesses mm -hmm. to actually be a force for good and to actually drive the, 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 the mission of sort of social justice and uh, sustainability, okay. for example. And the, and the diversity and inclusion agenda, too, is an important part of that. Absolutely. And what's interesting about trust is that I think most organizations have identified it as a need. They mm. want to build it, mm -hmm. but it's how do you build it? Um, I come from a country that has the highest level of trust in the world. So yes. Denmark has 78% trust between citizens. So somebody you don't know in the street, uh, you eight out of ten Danes trust that person, okay? And so in, in Denmark, it's uh, the images uh, they have strollers with babies sleeping in them outside restaurants while the parents are having lunch inside. So the trust is super mm, high. Mm. Um, and and so when you when you live or you come from a society of trust, um, I approach this as a natural thing, okay? So I I give out trust and I try to behave myself as a trustworthy person. Um, just France has the opposite level of trust. They That's have a true. level of trust of 22%. So most people don't trust the other person they don't know. So it's something that they have to build and construct uh, in communities. Mm. And mm. it's possible. It's not because you come from a country where mm. the trust is mm. low that you can't build it. But often when I do my, my teachings and my master classes, I ask the question to a group of people, do you consider yourself to be a trustworthy person? Because this is where this whole thing starts. Um, and in most cases, I have a hundred percent of the hands being raised mm. saying, I do, yeah, I consider myself to be a trustworthy person. So how do, how do we explain the Delta? If we all consider ourselves to be trustworthy people, how do we get to 22% in France? For instance, 25% approximately in Europe as an, as an average, mm. according to some studies. And so it's, it's actually these things in terms of implementing or building, uh, cultivating trust as, as to start with, um, actually you need to sit down and look at yourself. And again, I mean, I talked about self-awareness. Think about when you raise your hand, I want to say, prove it to me. What is it you do to make you a trustworthy person? Because I think most of us during the pandemic, mm -hmm. once or twice, maybe, and I realize I'm saying this on video, yeah. maybe once or twice we signed a document saying that we're going to go to deliver uh, a me you know, medicine to a close family member and we actually went for a walk or we actually uh, you know, did something else. Um, and that's, you know, mm -hmm. can you trust the person who did that? This is a, that's a question. That is it is a question, <laughs> but I'm raising it because, yeah. because I think we need to be very aware of um, all of these values we want to have. Mm -hmm. What is it and how do you, how do you incarnate it yourself? And what is your willingness to take that risk with that mm. other person mm. who yeah. signed that piece of paper saying, I'm going to deliver medicine to a close family member and did I, something I, else? I, th I think, Marlene, I think mutual trust is an essential ingredient of a healthy corporate culture. And uh, we, can, we can talk about the, you know, the trust uh, that we, we must have or should have in our employees to, to, <laughs> to deliver or act responsibly or to, to, to meet their objectives. But it's a two-way street. Mm. And I, I, I think employees increasingly need to have and feel a sense of trust in the organization yes. in which they work, in the teams and the management teams 
uh, in which they, they, uh, they find themselves or they find themselves in some respects uh, led by. We have a professor at ESCP, her name is Emmanuel Leon, who does mm. research on uh, human resource management. And she wrote during the pandemic about this transition we're having in styles of management. Yeah. From something that was very, you know, hierarchical, top down, yes. to more of a task based management. And it, it just entirely relates to what you're both saying because it requires having a common purpose. You can do your tasks, you can, you know, know what you're working towards when you yeah. know why. And it yes. has the trust. So yes. rather than having this um, yes. kind of presenteeism, I know you're working because you're at your desk, hmm. it's rather you're accomplishing the tasks that are going to help us reach our common objective, cool. and I trust that you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. felt like that. Well, I think sometimes we talk of shared intention mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to shared purpose, but ostensibly it's the, it's the same thing. I think we have to ask ourselves whether or not there is a, a shared intention or a shared purpose within our organization. And I think it's troubling if the answer to that is no. Mm. <laughs> <It's troubling. laughs> it sounds like you're going to be it's significantly less troubling. competitive in the And I think, if, you know, in, in, in strategy for a long while, we've talked about sort mm -hmm. of mission and vision and values in alignment with our mission and our vision. But I think it's a, deep, it's, it's a deeper thing. And it's yeah. about a, a construction of a community of values and a community where there is this sort of sense of mutual, uh, mutualism or mutual identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that very often is linked, explicitly linked, uh, to this shared purpose concept. Now, I think the challenge is how to get there. Right. Uh, and and I, know, I, I know we've, we've had some conversation ab about how we get to that point, and it's not straightforward. Which, let's, let's dive into that. So I want to start first, because you both, you know, you're an executive coach. You are in charge of the executive education department. You are working with these business leaders on a regular basis. Well, I want to start with them. You've mentioned some things about qualities that make a business leader today. But to dive into that a little deeper, how would you say we should define leadership today, given everything you've just said about what employees are looking for, what work mm. environment we need? I think it's a capacity, again, I mean, I think authenticity is, is a key word, mm. uh, being mm. an authentic leader. It's very difficult to, you can't change people a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but make them be themselves to a higher degree and realize that being having the values that they have um, is one way of being in the world, but it's not the way of being in the world. No. And so it's basing the, basically the, the capacity to... Um, to see, understand, and accept other people in a room. Um, this is one of the ingredients to create um, psychological safety in an organization. And for me, this is um, the objective that I, that I introduce and that I, um, that I uh, invite people to really uh, go for. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you have psychological safety, um, people dare to ask a question, mm -hmm. submit an idea, and admit an error. Mm -hmm. And they're not scared by doing that, that they'll be mocked or uh, punished mm -hmm. by the other members of the group. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether they're peers, superiors, or uh, working in their teams. When you feel scared to basically ask a question, you might, because you didn't understand completely what was said, you might take it the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of not having psychological safety, apart from the fact that psychological safety also leads is very closely linked to, to well-being. And so when people feel that they're safe to be themselves and they're generally speaking accepted, um, mm. whether even if that question wasn't the greatest question, I always find it really interesting that when I, when I go and do a speech and I have maybe hundreds of people in the room, you know, the, the few questions you get and I guess that everyone in the room has some kind of a question. We just don't dare. And so it's mm. this whole exposing ourselves. And so when, when organizations and leadership, they manage to, to, to create that kind of culture, for me, it's, um, it's a base that creates uh, performance, uh, it gives well-being, it creates engagement, you feel that you can be yourself, you're not scared, so, so that's a, a, key, a key point for me. I share that view fundamentally. I, I think very often we, we start talking about hard skills and competencies or we talk about the ability, for example, to, to vision, mm -hmm. uh, to make a decision, to enact, to visualize, um, to analyze. But I, I think leadership first and foremost is about the ability to 
uh, motivate, harness, and curate. Uh, and I think that a part of that process, the key part of that process actually, is harnessing the talent that you have at your disposal and, and uh, empowering others to do great things. I think too, too often we say that great leaders do great things. Well, I think great leaders actually enable and empower those with whom they work to do great things. I think that's by far the, the, uh, the, the, the better outcome. Uh, not to say that along the way a good leader doesn't want to make a, a strong personal contribution, but it's not enough. It's about, it's about creating the space, um, whether it's a context like a, one based on psychological safety mm. or, or a different type of environment. It's about creating the space where people can, can be uh, creative uh, and at their best in terms of their, their contribution to the organizational mission. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to recognize, particularly in a sort of post-pandemic context and in a world based on fast, furiously fast technological change, mm -hmm. that we ha also have a responsibility as a leader to help those with whom we work to develop. And you talked about executive education, and mm -hmm. I think that's very much the mission uh, of executive education to sort of propel uh, and, and support professional development. And mm -hmm. professional development often means learning and developing new skills. And I think this is where we, we have a great uh, uh, responsibility at ESCP and in general terms in the business school community. And that, by the way, was also one of the things that people said in the study, 9,000 people from BCG, was that, they, that you know, the, tra the training and the executive mm. um, education, um, you know, keeping, keep learning and developing your skills. So they want an, yeah, an investment on behalf of their company in mm -hmm. the future of, mm -hmm. of themselves as an, mm -hmm. as an individual. Well, we're talking yeah. at one level about a corporate culture where people feel that they can experiment, where they have a voice, mm -hmm. where they can mm -hmm. make contribution, where they're empowered. But I think also organizational cultures increasingly in, in, in today's uh, context need also to create space for learning and invest in, in, in learning and uh, personal and professional development. Personal development can include health and well-being. Professional development, I think we're talking about people very often upskilling or, or, mm. or, or reskilling in order to meet future challenges. Great, so we were just talking about how as an individual leader you can develop these skills that are going to make you uh, have potentially more empathy, you know, greater self-awareness. And what I want to ask now is, is how do you bring that down to the company-wide level? And for starters, is it actually even possible to change a company culture? Well, I, I let's start with what we understand and mean by a culture as a sort of complex whole of beliefs and assumptions and values. Mm -hmm. And cultures, when conceived in those terms, are of course learnt and, and, and acquired. You know, we spend time in a culture, or we're born into a culture, and we learn and acquire uh, its habits and its mental frames. And I guess what I'm saying is that cultures therefore take time to build, uh, and, and they can change. I mean, culture is evolutionary. Cultures can change, particularly corporate cultures with quite radical changes in personnel, uh, or, or priorities, but it's not a quick or, 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 or automatic process. And I think uh, it comes down to a series of uh, concrete actions and decisions uh, to, in, in some respects, uh, chart a course for the organization and associate the organization and its mission with very specific uh, values. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I think a part of that uh, is working out the relationship between the strategy, mission and vision of the organization and the, the, the values that underpin it. And that um, has proved difficult for many organizations. I mean, most people, when asked the question, does your company have a clear and strong corporate culture, say, no, it does not. So this is a challenge that evades the majority of organizations, whereas we would also think of of companies, maybe uh, uh, Patagonia, mm -hmm. Amazon, uh, Microsoft, as, as examples where there is a very strong and clear uh, corporate culture. I don't know, Malin, what do you think on this question? Well, 
I think you can have a, a strong brand and not have particularly a strong culture mm. in terms of, of well-being, at least, um, or engagement. Um, but it's, um, for me, and, and I agree with Simon, that it's, um, many people get it right in theory, so they define it, but actually making people change the behavior, mm. changing that big thing called culture, is, uh, it, it takes time. And it requires that leadership commits fully yes. to incarnating the values yep. that they decide to, um, to, to stand behind. Mm -hmm. And so let's say that's trust or empathy or something else or uh, empowerment. Um, if people don't see that acted out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a pretty clear way, then they don't believe in it. And what companies get wrong also in many cases is that they forget about the very human question, what's in it for me? Mm. And so when you ask somebody to change behavior, so a lot of companies mm. right now, they want people to be, to take more responsibility. So the empowerment is about people taking more responsibility. And so, and most people like that and it's great, but in many, in many cases it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Because people, the thinking, okay, so when I take responsibility, I take a certain risk because if I fail, what will happen? So one of the main um, issues that I address in companies is how do you relate to failure mm. and how do you relate to errors? And w how are people treated when it goes wrong? Mm. And some companies um, have great cultures. I, Google has a great culture in terms of failure. And so they have the, you know, the 20, uh, I don't know if they have it anymore, but they had the 20% rule where they had 20% of the time where they could do anything. They could just invent and, 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 and fail and then go at it again and just have this space where you're free to do. And, and so if you don't have a, um, a culture where errors and failure is okay, accept it, then it's very difficult to move mm. that big thing of trying new things. When you, when you work in change environments, mm -hmm. there needs to be mm. a certain degree of acceptance of, of not getting it right the first time. Uh, but I always start with uh, the managing director or the CEO of the company, the executive committee, and you've got to have these people get it right. They can stay who they are, but they got to um, consciously think about how do I incarnate that value? How do I act it out? It doesn't have to be the same way, but what is it in me that communicates trust or, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, the, there are values that come out. Empowerment is one of them. Um, daring is, is another one. Uh, how, do I, how do I incarnate that? When was I being daring or what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, so that's very that's very important. It, it's basically incarnation uh, in terms of getting the culture to move. Yeah, definitely. And I think that accepting mistakes and failure just fits perfectly with what you were saying earlier about learning culture. Well, I just I'm, I'm glad you bring me in on that point because I, I think there's a difference between the culture of the yeah. organization and the notion of a learning organization, mm -hmm. which has a learning culture, mm -hmm. and actually. Uh, organizations that are quite static in terms of their identity and culture are, are often not learning organizations and are not characterized by learning cultures. And as listening to Malina and I was thinking ab about two things. First of all, there is this process of learning as an organization, learning from your employees, from your stakeholders, from your customers, from your successes and your failures. Uh, I'm glad you underscore failures. Um, but then there is also the way in which you demonstrate your capacity to function as a learning organization by creating a constant multi-directional flow of learning and development throughout the organization. And uh, obviously in my field of, of work, working with, uh, with corporations in, in terms of their management development and, and, and corporate progression, we spend a lot of time with executives questioning whether or not they have a learning culture or trying to help them to develop a learning yeah. culture. And, and in essence, I'm talking about a culture in which uh, learning is truly embedded. It's truly embedded, not, not just as a, uh, a value within the organization, but also as practice. Now, is it important? Well, look at the speed of change in our societies, in our industries, in our sectors, in our 
economies, we're seeing uh, a, a dramatic increase in the speed at which uh, education and training needs to be either replaced or enhanced, substituted uh, or amplified. Uh, and that means that uh, strong organizations are putting increasing uh, emphasis on uh, professional and personal uh, development. And we go all the way back to where we started with the question about what do employees expect what of their want, yeah. employing mm -hmm. firms. This is one of the things that increasingly employees expect. They, it's not going back to school, but, but professional people, particularly uh, Gen Z, uh, want to be in a space where they can both work and learn. And whilst they're willing to learn outside of the organization, and they don't expect the organization to be the sole source of education and training, they do look to their employer to support them uh, practically and materially. And they certainly want space and opportunity to, to grow and develop as they go about their work. I have a, a nice example of an executive leader who he often asks his team, so, so did you make any mistakes in, or did you fail at anything lately? And people kind of feel embarrassed, you know, you don't, it's not exactly what you want to, to admit that you did. And if they say, oh, no, no, you know, I've had no mistakes lately and, you know, I didn't fail at anything. It's yeah. like, oh, you got to, you know, you're really, really enjoying, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're really you enjoying that. that comfort zone, you know, yeah. <laughs> not trying hard enough. No, but he's trying to tell them mm -hmm. it's okay. And, and actually, it's, we feel that if we haven't made any mistakes and we haven't failed at anything, we're good. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not the way we should necessarily see. I'm not encouraging people to go out and make mistakes. On, but, you know, if you don't try anything, you won't maybe fail. Or you yes, won't. it's not an entrepreneurial culture, is it? If no. There's, <laughs> if there's no experimentation or no willingness to, to take risks. Uh, uh, the problem, of course, is when you get the, the, the Wild West model in which uh, we do it's, not it's, it's completely want. unregulated and people want. are taking extreme risks without any sort of control. And if I may, uh, this is uh, really uh, something I've observed in the organizations that do trust well, mm -hmm. they frame it. They frame it so well, they define it, and contrary to what you might <coughs> think, trust is not warm and fussy necessarily. It's clear. Mm -hmm. It's about knowing what is the frame yes. that we have that we can work within. And it's actually also being extremely clear mm -hmm. when people go beyond it. And so in some organizations, let's say in the case of um, remote working and flexible working hours, oh. which is very popular. So mm -hmm. p somebody would say, oh, yes, but I said they, could, um, they had to be present between 10 and 6 p.m. OK, fine. Uh, and then he would say, and somebody would say, oh, well, yeah, but then this person shows up at 1030 and, you know, so you can't trust people. I treat them like adults. I made a frame. And, stuff. and I said, did you talk to the person about it? Well, no, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I don't want to go. And I said, well, if you don't, if you're not clear, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so address anything, not in a nasty way, but address it. Have that frame because otherwise people, if there are many gray zones, yeah. trust won't work because you, you don't understand, especially if you have a high number of um, people working in your company. Yeah, you won't know where you can move. You don't, no. And you won't dare necessarily when you're concerned of the repercussions. And if that was okay, then yeah. in other areas it mm -hmm. might be okay also to be 20 minutes late. Yeah. Um, and so it, when, you, when you're not clear, so one of the most easiest and best pieces of advice I can give people is that be clear, be, have that frame and be clear. Oh, I think that's a really good point to, to lead on. You know, when companies are trying to try to, to make these evolutions in, you know, their culture, which will take time, it's a lot about clarity and getting, you know, down to the, the fine tuning of what it actually means, what your values are, like you mentioned, Simon. Um, and just, a, I love the conversation around mistakes, just the choice over on our, the choice that you did at we love mistakes, and we just released a podcast that's all about that. Um, with a professor of entrepreneurship where we talk with business leaders not about what made them successful actually because you know you kind of feel like you hear those stories all the time but rather where they screwed up mm. and like how they moved on from that or what they learned mm. or what they regret you know for example from from their career so I love I love that and I think you know um, that's a conversation that I, that I feel is being had more and more. McKinsey just recently did, released a, a report where they talk about learning from mistakes in a company and the <coughs> benefits um, I would like to take an opportunity to try and summarize some of the things that you've said and see if you agree before we move on to our last questions. So I have the impression from what you both said that what employees are looking for is that summarizes everything is it's sort of like an implication in their company. 
that they are moving forward together. And it comes from both investment on the company on them as an individual, in terms of their future place within the business, so that they evolve with the business. Also looking at them not just as cogs in the machine, but as you know, individuals who are going to grow potentially in their careers. And then all of that, you know, in order to feel a part, that recognition, which you said right at the very beginning, mm. you want to feel a part of something. Mm -hmm. And that requires trust, that requires recognition, mm -hmm. that requires investment, mm -hmm. and it requires an understanding of what you're all doing together anyways. I wanted to know, does that, does that feel like a truth to you? I think you captured that very well. I would just add one thing, which is I think ideally there's a sense of alignment mm. in terms of personal objectives and right. personal priorities and those of the organization for which you work. I mean, I think that's the healthiest state and condition. That's yeah. probably what we all seek and, uh, and search for. Um, one thing that I think is important to be aware of uh, in, in organizations is uh, one of the many studies on, on, on culture or um, has shown that actually a manager spent uh, about 40% of their time um, in conflicts. Yeah, um, too much conflict and it's, it, yeah. the mental burden of being in a situation, or it can be s some sort of a misunderstanding, not really not understanding the other person, or th or judging the other person, mm. thinking that somebody that Peter is arrogant, or that Susanna is lazy, or you know whatever you might think about. And so, forty percent is a lot. And this this amount of time, people don't work on the file. They're working on the relationship and in that area mm -hmm. of misunderstanding mm -hmm. slash judging slash conflict. Yeah. And so um, if, you, if you manage to reduce 40% to a, a, a much smaller percentage, uh, you actually gain productivity and you also gain well-being because conflict and misunderstanding are never good ingredients mm -hmm. in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of building quality of relationships. So that's something, and, yeah. and people feel better, they have more energy and they don't spend it <laughs> On, in, in, in a conflictual situation with, no. with somebody else. And, and let's make no mistake, you know, we're not talking about things that we like to see in an organizational setting mm -hmm. because they are some, somehow a part of the process of making us feel better <laughs> about life, about our work, about our company. These are, when we're talking about well-being and an investment in health and well-being, trust, flexibility in terms of the way you enable people to work and investment in equity, diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. these pay off in the bottom line. I mean, there's a huge well. amount of evidence yeah. that shows that the real benefits of this are, are or, or benefits of this are demonstrable, uh, that this contributes to organizational and commercial success. It's not, it's not simply about doing good or responding to what people say they they need and value. It's a virtuous circle. Absolutely. It's something that's going to increasingly be, I mean, it already is important, am I right? But, but in terms of the change that you were saying is happening, it, it's required if you want it's to remain required. competitive there's and a, if you want to a, evolve there, the I mean, You started with the question about retention of talent. Yeah. There's a huge correlation between the degree to which organizations invest in their learning culture mm -hmm. and promote a positive culture based on the elements that Melina has summarized so well for us, and their ability to recruit and retain the best talent. Yeah, absolutely. That sums up perfectly kind of this message we wanted and this conversation we wanted to have together. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing with me your insights and with the audience and the choice uh, today. So we really appreciate it. Great thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap on ESCP Live. So I welcome you to visit The Choice, which is at thechoice.escp.eu, where we take conversations like this one um, and go a little bit further. We've recently had some things on emotional intelligence. We're looking at the future of work and how management is evolving. So we'll, of course, have support elements that are going to follow this conversation between Simon and Malene. Um, and we welcome you to continue the conversation with us on The Choice and at ESCP. Thank you very much.